How y'all doing? Yeah. Let me start by asking how many people are old Beaufort? When I say that, I'm talking about you were here before Urban Renewal. Okay. Oh, look at that. Look at that. I got, I got some hands there. Good, good. Uh, Karen and I stay in communication. And she said the theme for this year's Parlor Talk series is going to be about change. And I said, well, that's okay. I can do that. I can, I can talk about change in Beaufort. And so I started putting together a program, and I didn't realize, I mean, we'd be here until next week or further than that. So I, I said, call, call Karen back. I said, Karen, I, this is uh, sort of getting overwhelming. How about if I just do Front Street? And she said, well, that sounds good. So that's what I plan to do today. I'm not gonna to try to talk about all the changes that have occurred in Beaufort and that continue to happen almost on a daily basis. Instead, what I want to do is I want you to pretend that we are going to take a walk down Front Street and we're gonna start at the turntable on the west end of it and we're gonna look at all the things that have changed uh, over the past three centuries, perhaps, maybe even less time than that. And we'll talk a little bit, maybe I'll tell you a couple stories about some of the places and what I remember happening there. And, it, and this is not gonna be formal. If you all have a question, just raise your hand and we will talk about whatever you want to hear about for a while. Okay, uh, I'm Jeff Adair. I grew up in Beaufort. Uh, I was born in 1955 over in Moorhead City at the hospital, but as soon as I could get to Beaufort in my parents' car, I was back to Beaufort. I grew up the first eight and a half years of my life at 121 Craven Street, which is uh, now an art uh, studio, I guess. Uh, then we moved, we moved away. It was a long way away. We moved to Orange Street. And, uh, <laughs> and I remained there until I went off to college in 1974. After that, I, I came back to visit my parents quite frequently, spent vacations in Beaufort and such as that, but I, I didn't ever really live there again until probably five or six years ago. I fell back in love with Beaufort after I retired and had never sold the house that I grew up in, and so I'm now restoring that house on Orange Street. And in fact, we're about, I'd say, probably 70% through with that now. And uh, so we stay down, I stay in Beaufort now 70% of my time easily, easily. I come down every day from Newburn where I'm, that's where my driver's license says that I live, but, but I'm really more Beaufort. In. So let's, let's start with one of my favorite photographs. I wish you could see it, I wish it was bigger, but that is of course the Duncan house down by the turntable. But conspicuously absent from that is the turntable, okay? Uh, the reason for that is because the Duncans owned that whole property uh, that went all the way over to the breakwater and it was called Duncans Green. There was no street there though. The street ended before it got to their property. Uh, and so people would come there and play golf and do all kinds of things on the front lawn. This is a photograph, the top one there, it was taken of, uh, by a fellow named Alfonso Thomas, a local guy, Al Thomas. Al was a good photographer because he would not only capture life in Beaufort, but he also would date the photographs and put the people's names on them, which has, for a historian, that's like a gold mine. Now, the problem with Al is he wouldn't write on the back of the photograph, he would always write on the front of the photograph. <laughs> and so I found a way to edit Al's write, writing off, so I did that on this photograph. But I can tell you it was, it was taken in 1922. And he actually wrote the name of those two people on there, but I cannot make out his handwriting sometime. And this is one of those instances. I don't know who they are. Uh, and that's a photograph that I took uh, probably two years ago when I was putting a, a, a program like this together. Not exactly the same program, but close. Like right right and you can see that, uh, that the street, if you look over the young lady's left shoulder, you can see that the street actually ends right there in front of the house. And, uh, there was no turntable. Interestingly enough, the Thomases gave uh, the town of Beaufort an easement across their property and I don't know when that happened but it was sometime after the 20s and I think that they still own the property underneath what is now the turntable I think that that has never been uh, actually bought by the town I think that it's still a Duncan easement that goes uh, under the street I think 
Now this is what was Duncan's Green. It's actually a mud flat, low tide, but it was taken from, the photograph was taken from Duncan's Green. That's Piper's Island over in the distance. Uh, so there was no radio island in those days. That was pumped up in the 40s uh, from dredging spoils. And that's a 1909 Curtis airplane that was a seaplane that came to Beaufort. And of course, everybody in their town, uh, town stopped what they were doing to go look at the, at the airplane because it was such an unusual event. Uh, flight had only been occurring six years prior to probably when this photo was taken. Uh, so, yeah. But in Gallup's Channel was a lot narrower in those days because the water actually went through the sound over on what is now Radio Island. I mean, that was all marsh. But Gallup's Channel, when they put Radio Island there, Gallup's Channel became deeper and faster and wider because it was a natural channel then. This is the Manson House uh, that was taken before the seawall was built in 1917. You can see the, the land goes up. Not a lot has changed here. If you just look at this one little photograph, uh, a friend that is in the audience today and I went out on his boat one time about two years ago and he slowly motored me around while I took pictures of Beaufort's waterfront. And this is one of those photographs right there. Uh, that, as you can see, is pretty much the way it looks now, except that the seawall now exists, built in 1970. We'll talk more about that in just a second. This is the Davis House. Uh, now, that photograph itself is an old photograph. Sarah Davis was an entrepreneur in Beaufort back uh, after the Civil War sometime. She had a hotel. It wasn't really a hotel, it was a house. In fact, she called it the Davis House. Uh, and she expanded by buying two adjacent houses and joining them together under one roof. And it became the Davis Hotel, which was a uh, focal point in Beaufort for a lot of different reasons. First of all, it had a dock that it went out into uh, the juncture between Gallant's Channel and Taylor's Creek, but that's where the mail boat landed because there was no train in those days and there was no road Beaufort, there was a road, but it wasn't, it was what is now Highway 101, and it was basically a pig path. So if you came to Beaufort, you came by way of boat. And uh, everybody who visited landed at the mail dock, which was right there uh, at Davis Hotel. Uh, it was also a very favorite place for people to come and spend the summer. They would come down to Beaufort and, and uh, stay in a room, you know, a month or two months and avoid the heat of Raleigh and Charlotte and places like that. This is one such person, I think, probably sitting on the rocking chair enjoying a southwest wind on a hot summer day in the 30s. Uh, I think it was in the 30s because uh, that's when one of the architectural surveys of Beaufort was done and some photographs were made, and I think this is one of them. We see electricity up at the top, but not much electricity. You can see two thin lines go in there, uh, and so the house probably was electrified, but, but uh, not much. Now this is an interesting photograph because it's also of the Davis house after it was joined together, at least with one roof. You can see there's gaps in the roof in the back where you know it was done basically as a breezeway. Uh, over at the right, you can see Joe House's house, which is still there. Uh, I don't remember what his name. See, when I was a kid, we named it after the people who lived there, and Mr. Joe House and his wife lived in the house. And I'm talking about the one that's right there. Uh, but these two people here are interesting characters. I think that the one on the left is a man named Steve Turner. He ran the mail boat along with his partner, and that's the man to the right, Palmer Davis. I do a whole talk about Palmer Davis. <laughs> he is such an interesting character. You may have attended that. Uh, Palmer Davis was a slave that grew up on Davis Island which is uh, an unusual because it's right next to Davis Shore, the community of Davis, and uh, it was the only black community down east, and those people lived very comfortably with the down east population. And the only reason why Davis Shore isn't still a black community was the hurricane of 1933 wiped out the community. But Palmer Davis grew up there and came to Beaufort and was uh, a, a sea, seaman. Uh, he was a guy who did a lot of good work in town, I'll tell you about that in a minute, uh, but he also ran for 18 years the mail boat that ran between the Davis Dock and uh, right down here, uh, Shepherd's Point. And 
the train would drop off the mail and then these guys would pick it up at the sack, put it in their Sharpie and sail it back to Beaufort. And that happened every day with almost without fail for 18 years. Afterwards, Palmer Davis became the butler when he couldn't, when he couldn't be the mail guy anymore because the train came and notes in 1906 and 1907, he became the butler at the Davis house hotel. And that's what you see right here. Hmm. Here he is again, I think, standing on the steps, and you see a modern photograph of the Davis House Hotel. It's still the Davis House. I don't think it's a hotel anymore. I'm not sure what it is. It's condos. It's condos. Like, okay. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. 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 So. Well, three. It's three condos, but they've all got different names. Two stories. Well, the, the buildings um, originally were people's houses, so probably named after the people who Yeah, because I think one of them's Mason. That would make sense. And then another one. But one of them is still Davis. Right? Now, what I've done so we can keep our bearings is I've taken <coughs> pictures of the street signs. So we're going to switch over now. We're going to go across <coughs> Moore Street. We're still going to stay on Front Street. And the first thing we're going to look at is the house I just talked about. And I cannot remember for the life of me what the name of that house is. If Mary Warshaw was here, she could tell you right off the top of her head, but I can't. I can tell you that Joe House had lived there with his wife when I was a child. He was the druggist in town. And you'll see why he's important in a little bit. Okay, and here's another picture of Front Street that was taken from a colorized postcard from back in the 1920s or early 1930s. Now, one of the things that uh, I can tell you that's interesting is the second house from the right with the red roof. That house is there today, but that's not the original house that was there. The original house that was there was demolished, and that house was built in, in instead using some of the same timbers from the original house. In what but, year? Uh, I don't know. It was it was definitely in the teens or twenties. It was a long. Time. I could probably go back and look at it and see. It's not plaque, is it? No, it isn't. But I don't know if that's just because they don't want a plaque, or if it's because mm -hmm. it's not. I think it's eligible. I really do. I think it's over a hundred years old. Yeah. Okay. But so I mean, except for that house, not much has changed from this, and you'll see from this picture. Except for the trees are larger, uh, which is not unusual. But uh, the people in Beaufort just had something against trees back in the old days. They, had, they owned trees out on the roadside, but not too many trees in their yards. At least it seems that way. Okay. So not a lot's changed there. But this part has. This is directly across the street. There's the house that's on the corner over there in the extreme, extreme right. But what you're looking at there is the, is the front part of something called the Sanders Cotton Press. Not a lot of people know that, but there was a big cotton press that existed on the south side of Front Street, uh, right in front, almost directly in front of the slough house. And uh, it was there probably for a good solid 20, 30, 40 years, something like that. And what they did was they took cotton in from the various fields around Carter County and pressed it into bales, and then they were shipped away and by boat too. Uh, later on by train, but originally by boat. That mule over there is waiting to, he, he's on a cart to carry probably to the train station, maybe. All right, and I'll show you this. Yes. Sarah, um, you know that if you're walking down Front Street and you get to where that was, yeah. Great big old square piece of concrete out there. Jay, I'm glad you bring that up because here it is. <laughs> if you look at the bottom, and we're going to talk about that in just a second, there's, there's a frontal view of the cotton press and what's there now, which is docks. I took the, the photograph in the bottom. And there's this great big thing, this concrete something in the lower right hand corner of the lower photograph. And it was there when it was, it looked almost like that when I came to Orange Street in 1963 because there was a core of, of engineers dock where that red dock is now, roughly. And that was the dock that all the local kids swam from. Uh, it, you know, we'd go down there, the Corps of Engineers crowd, Tom Abel ran it, and, and he didn't care if we swam, and so we did. And I remember puzzling about what in the world that thing was in 1963 when I swam there. Uh, and here's what I think, and here's a better view of it in just a second. Now, before we go too much further, here's a cotton press from the back. That boat sitting there with cotton bales on it is the Alfonso. 
Who remembers the Alfonso? Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. That is actually the Alfonso when she was still a freighter running back and forth in Carter County up and down the rivers and taking cargo. But the cotton press you can see is right there in front. You can see the houses on Front Street. You can actually see the dock that later became the uh, Corps of Engineers dock, I think. This is a cotton press. It's not the one. But it is what cotton presses look like, hydraulic cotton presses in those days, and they were heavy iron things that had a lot of machinery. <clears throat> and you couldn't put those on a wooden floor over a, some water because it would simply punch right through the floor. So this is what Jay was talking about. I think that that's the remnants of the old cotton press, the old Sanders cotton press, the last remnant of it. If you look at the wood, you can see the grain of the wood that was left in the concrete. You see that it was done with an old, large circular saw that would have been the kind of saws that sawmills would have used in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, you can also see that it was made out of an amalgam of oyster shells and concrete. And if you look at any other structure in Beaufort from those days, that's exactly what foundations and, <coughs> and columns were made of. And finally, you can't see this too well, but if you look in it closely, you can see ballast stones <coughs> that are about the size of between a soccer ball and a grapefruit. And that almost certainly means that that thing was scoured together from the waterfront. When I was a child, ballast stones were all up and down in the front there. Mm -hmm. You know, low tide, you could just pick them up. And so that structure and the way it looks and the way it was made tell me that it was made there probably around the turn of the century or just before. And uh, that's probably the pedestal that the old cotton press itself stood on. And it's still there today if you want to go look at it. Okay. Now, further down, this is the old barber's machine shop. And a lot of people remember that. The man looking, looking very serious there in the, in the bluish, dark gut colored jacket with the uh, golfy hat on is Mr. J.R. Bar Barber Sr. He was my across the street neighbor when we moved to Orange Street in 1963. Uh, he was an elderly man then. This photograph was taken in, I think, 1950-something, 1940-something. It must have been 49 because it celebrated, or maybe 59, it celebrated, I think, their 50th anniversary. And I want to say that the, that, that Barber's Machine Shop, I think it was established in 1919. I think I'm right. So anyhow. Young Mr. Barber is the man with the leather jacket with his arm stuck out on the side. Of, he married Ruth Peeland later on. Do you all remember her? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And the man in the white sweater beside Mr. Elder Mr. Barber is Lance Smith. Do you all remember Lance Smith? Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, there's some characters there. <laughs> the building in the background here is the old catamaran building that used to have um, the restaurant. Wow. Spouters in until it burned down what three or four years ago. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You okay, Rachel? You have a flash? Oh, so okay. I, I thought you were having your own little personal summer there. Right? I, 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 okay. Yeah. And here, here's what it looks like now. That was the old barber's machine shop when I was a kid. That that paint scheme they kept for a long, long time, and that's what it looks like now. I think it's a private residence, unless I'm mistaken. Yeah, the guy who owns the Panthers temper. Well, he used to. I think that there was some. I think there was some issues that. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. Now this is the front in orange. I've already talked to Pam a little bit about this house. I think this is called the Jacob Henry House. In my in my day, it was Jackie Booth's house. Yeah. Jackie Booth and Bobby Booth and and David Booth and Diane. They were twins. All grew up there. Excuse me? Miss Sarah, don't forget Miss Sarah. Sarah. Miss Sarah Jones, that's right. She was a booth and then she became a Jones, but all the kids came with her. And they were my best friends when I moved to Orange Street and for a long time thereafter. I think Bobby is still, he's, he's gone away and come back, I believe. He's in Warhead. Yep. <clears throat> well, Diane and everybody, well, David's on one side here, I think. I don't know. David was working with Connor and Mobile Homes for yeah, a long time. Yeah, Nashville. Okay. No, Nashville. 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 But anyhow, that's that. That's where, and that's where Al Thomas lived. By the way, remember me tell you about Al Thomas? He used to take pictures of everybody, and right. you know, yeah. until he went off to World War One. That's where he lived. Further down, this is an old picture of uh, 
the waterfront before the uh, 1917 when the when the uh, seawall was built, and that in the background, Thomas Thomas House, right at the corner of Orange and Front. That's the Cedars. That's a house that our building that's no longer there. That was a hardware store in those days. Alan Woodard's house, Mary Mary, uh, Mary Allen's house. Am I am I right? Yeah. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. behind that, right? Yeah, but when I was growing up, it was the Braille Yard. It was that Char uh, we'll, Charlie Glover's. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll get we'll get to it. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. <laughs> trust, me, trust me. And that's the picture as best I can determine from the exact same way, uh, at same angle. Now, by the way, let me tell you about this picture up here, the top. One. When I was a kid, I worked. When I say a kid, I was a teenager. I worked for a lawyer here in town, Wiley Taylor, as a title searcher. <laughs> and Wiley would take the damnedest things, pardon my French, he would take the darndest things in, in fees. He might come back with a boat that he somebody had given him to keep him out of jail, or he might come back with no telling what, food, corn, uh, jugs of wine that people have made, you know. He would take anything for a fee. But one day, he took a bunch of old glass plate negatives as a fee from a client. And Wiley was a photographer, and he had a dark room in the back of his little office there, right next to Big Daddy Wesley's. And we went in the back, and we put those black glass plate negatives, and it turned out that it was from a guy who had come through town about the turn of the last century, about 1900 or maybe before, with a glass plate camera, a big old white, you know, big old camera. And he had taken a bunch of pictures of Beaufort, and that's what these negatives were. Mm -hmm. I never knew what happened to those negatives until I was over talking to Patricia Suggs at the VHA, and she said, well, let me show you some old pictures I got. And there was some of them. Not all of them, but some of them. So, And that's one of them. So that's an original from, I don't know, before the, before the sea war. But uh, this old guy apparently was posing, has got his pocket knife out, he was doing some whittling, and uh, right there in front of what is now the Cedars or actually in front of the old Woodard house. Yeah. Now, across the street, by the way, I was telling this to Pam, when you do historical research and get photographs, there's an inordinate amount of photographs in Beaufort that was taken during disasters. <laughs> Fires, hurricanes, it's like everybody, you know, there was a camera on the shelf, well, we can't really afford to take, they did a film kind of high, but isn't that house burning down? Bob, get the camera. <laughs> and all the pictures I've got of, that I've gotten from various various places, but most of them are storm related or fire related or something. So anyhow, this is Harold Simpson's old Texas uh, Texaco station, right across the street from the corner, and uh, there is the railways that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Ch Captain Charlie Glover was the guy who who went there. He was, he ran it yeah. for Otis Purefoy. Not as careful what kept his, uh, he would fix his, his charter boats there. Uh, and that's, but that's, that's Hurricane, I think, I think Hazel, I think. But there were three in 55 and one more in 1960. That was Don. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, it could have, in those days, it could have been a lot of different storms. There's Harold Station. And here's what's there now. Now, what, this, this week is a taco stand. Yeah. <laughs> true, true. Yeah. The oil, oil the, that's right. Beaufort Oil Company is there, and around the corner is the Front Street Grill, I think. Yep. Yeah, that's where the that's where Front the Street was. Front Street Grill is. Uh, that's where uh, it, there was a dock there, a the fuel dock. Harold had a dock there and had a little alcove, and that's where Pete Cobb and I, one of my good friends, used to go smoke cigarettes. And uh, it's a wonder we didn't blow up the damn town, <laughs> but we didn't. Now there's a better picture of Captain Charlie's yeah, uh, ways. That's, That's that place is special to me because all of Captain Otis Purefoy's boats in those days were made out of wood. I don't think he had any fiberglass boats, uh, so he would bring them over, and Captain Charlie would would uh, Glover would raise them up on the ways like this boat is right here. You can see the one in the foreground. Those in the back, they're shad boats. You already know that. But uh, he would bring one of those boats up, and he would work on it. But and there was a great big bandsaw in that little shack, that building there. And he would saw up juniper, 
and there would be juniper oil scraps about this amount of foot, scraps of juniper, and I would go pick them up and I would stick them together and I would carve decoys out of them when I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. uh, shorebirds and decoys, and that's how I started carving decoys and became interested in a decoy museum. So, but yeah, that was a, that was a long time ago. There's another storm pictures, and you can see that the, there, actually you can see the bandsaw. There is the bandsaw right there. That was a huge bandsaw. Bobby Booth and I would go there and cut wood when Charlie wasn't looking. We wouldn't turn it on because we would have had our butts with. But if we, I would put the wood in and then Charlie, uh, Bobby would, would spin it by hand. And, and that's how we cut wood. <laughs> yeah. And that's what's there now, it is a wedding venue. Yeah. Right over. By the way, that was after the top ones after Hurricane Donna, I think. One of, one of the oddest Purefoy boats just across the sidewalk because the water came up that high. Now, a little bit further down was the Paul Motor Company. And this photograph I took out of an annual, that's a couple of high school girls from East Carter back in the late, no, the early 60s, middle 60s, like 66. I think East Carter started in 67, 68, something like that. Five. Five, okay, so that's about then. Uh, and you can see they're posing for the Paul Motor Company. Paul Motor Company was originally founded by this man right here. And that's Luther Paul. When people started having automobiles in the rest of the world, Luther built his own. And that is that is Luther Paul and his family riding in front of the Davis House Hotel uh, on Front Street in an automobile that he constructed completely on his own. It was chain driven. Uh, it had some kind of a little gasoline engine in the front, <clears throat> but it was basically a wagon, uh, you know, a horse and drawn wagon with a motor on it. But that's Luther Paul and his original car. Here's another mile to, uh, Here's another Paul Motor Company photograph taken by Alan Wood or Clem, one or the other. Uh, you can see the what is now Finn's in the very background there. That's David, isn't it? David Booth right there. Uh, he, maybe. Maybe. I would think that David might have been a little bit younger than that, because that might that if that's Hurricane Hazel or even Diane yeah, or Ryan, right, right. he would have been he would have yeah. been smaller than that. Yeah. There's a better picture of it. And my father had a service station uh, right there. It was an SO station. And the police station. And the police. We'll, we'll get there. there, yeah. okay. <laughs> there there's what Paul it looks like. It, that's where Paul Motor Company was now, and it's got the Warcraft Center on it, uh, and maybe a little bit of what's uh, Moon Records, too. Can't tell for sure. But that's the change that's occurred there. Oops, mm -hmm. sorry. Now, on the other side of the street, and I think Steve, where are you, Steve? Right I think Steve sent me this photograph. Uh, am I right, Steve? Yeah. Yes. Uh, that is actually one of the earliest photographs of the old Seabreeze the Theater that I've ever seen. We know it's early because Mr. Paul, Luther Paul, same one I just showed you a picture of, yeah changed the front of the, the facade of that building sometime after it had been running for a few years. And I don't know exactly when that was. I can tell you that the, that the uh, warehouse thingy that was in the front yard of Mary Ellen's house that we just talked about is still right there in this photograph. But that's the Seabree, old Seabreeze Motel, uh, Seabreeze uh, yeah. movie theater yeah. Yeah. before the facade was changed. Then it got changed to look like that. That's the sea breeze. That's actually the mayor of the town in the hurricane of 1924 riding through in his model A or whatever that is. But you can see the sea breeze was a lot more upscale after, after the front of the thing was changed. And that's what it looks like now, same location. That's where the uh, Hampton, no, not that's, uh, that's something that I'm dating myself now. Yeah. The Maritime Museum yeah. is there. There's another picture in 1920, uh, the top one, of the old Seabreeze, um, I keep wanting to call it a hotel, the Seabreeze Theater. Um, this picture I know was taken in 1920 because I was scanning through the internet one night and I stumbled on a series of photographic negatives 
that had been taken by a name, uh, a man named R uh, Reginald Spellman, S P E L L M A N, had taken them in 1920 of Beaufort when he was here with his family visiting uh, William Potter family at Ann Street House. They were in the Duke archives, and so I managed to sneak them out, and they were almost unrecognizable, and it took me a lot of editing to get those photographs back to life, <clears throat> but they, uh, that was one of them, and it is a 19, November of 1920 photograph of the corner of Front Street and Turner Street, and it's looking west. You can see the Texaco station down the street there, uh, <clears throat> and you can see the the, the sea breeze <clears throat> and over to the right are wooden buildings that are where Fabricate is now. No, Beaufort Linens. Beaufort Linens. I thought it was the bank. The bank no. and the wrong corner. Yep, you're on the wrong corner. We are, okay. yep, the, we're, looking, we're looking west. You can so, see the top of my house through that's the right. Bank. Exactly, exactly. The Woodard House is let's see if I'm going to it right there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So obviously that looks a lot, it looks so much different that uh, in my photograph at the bottom, there's really nothing there anymore that was in the original photograph. Mm -hmm. By the way, I probably have more photographs of the corner of Turner and Front than just about anywhere else. It was a mm -hmm. very popular place to take photographs. Mm -hmm. This is across the street. None of these buildings are there anymore. It's roughly where Finn's is now because that Texaco station later became a golf franchise and then after the golf station was closed, it became Finn's restaurant. So the gears crowd over that, still do. Uh, I was telling Pam earlier, this lady here is a, a scaring lady. I can't remember this guy's name right here, smoking the cigarette. I can tell you this was in the hurricane of 1924, also where the mayor was driving his car by the <coughs> sea breeze. But that guy, and I, I've got it written down, but I don't have it at my fingertips. That guy was sort of a Beaufort gadfly. And uh, he was, he drank a little bit. And uh, sad to say, and he was apparently dating a scaring lady at the time. They never got married. Because a couple of years after this photograph was taken in 1924, he was thrown in jail locally. Uh, I envision him as being sort of like uh, the guy on Andy Griffith. Uh, Ernst. 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 Yeah. that kind of guy <laughs> except he was smoking a cigarette and he lit the mattress that he was laying on on fire and he, he burned up in the fire oh. so, yeah. so uh, that's what happened to him here is a here's a photograph of the same corner this one is taken from the Lipman building which we're going to, have to talk about in a minute too now interestingly enough and you know, y'all hear a lot of funny stories about this, but this really was the folk, this was the police station. That is not that is not a satellite office of the police station. That is the police station until I was until I well until Urban Renewal, I guess. Yeah, they just bathrooms now. Hmm? It's bathroom, bathroom, which is appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 that's right. It's, it's, it's a head. Now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, later later on, it, it occurred to me that at some point somebody would be interviewing a defendant, you know, or a suspect, and yeah. either the suspect or the police officer would have to stand outside. <laughs> and uh, you know, well, correct me if I'm wrong. It wasn't even open full time. No, it wasn't manned. It was only like one and a half policemen. That's about right. Hey, Guy Sprinkle, who was the chief, but yeah. Guy Guy would go home and go to bed, and then you'd have your other police officer, whoever that was this you know this week or this month, <laughs> and uh, he would he would get in his car and go patrolling, and then they would slot the door to the police station. Yeah. So uh, anyhow, then it became yeah. a um, taxi stand, right? No, there's the taxi stand right there. Now that's Floyd Johnson's taxi taxi stand. Oh. He had a guy work for him, a black guy named um, Jewel Jordan. And Jewel apparently had survived a shad boat wreck at some point, sinking. Uh, I don't know which one it was, but uh, apparently he decided that was enough of shad fishing and he became uh, a taxi cab driver for, for uh, Mr. Floyd uh, Johnson. But that's the old Johnson taxi cab right there. And uh, that's, that's the police station right there. And that's how I remember Carrot Island when I was growing up. There was no foliage uh -uh. whatsoever, nothing. It was, like I was just I was, a sandbar. That's right. Well, it was. The, we all called it the bird show. 
Yes. And people say, why do you call it the bird song? Well, because it was a shovel when we were growing up. It, yeah. That would go under at high tide and go the out and low tide. Right. <clears throat> and of course, all of those big things out there in the back, that's some shad boats. But like I say, I'm, I think I'm talking to a local crowd here, that, so I don't need to tell you about that. You can look at that picture and tell me when it was taken. It was not, not the date, but you can tell me the season of the year. You know, that's autumn. It's probably about Thanksgiving or between Thanksgiving and Christmas. There's the police station at high tide. <laughs> no, that's, a, that's actually one of the hurricanes. Yeah, that's one of the hurricanes, I don't know which. That building to the, it, on the corner is the old colonial store. That store burned down sometime later and a new one was built, a new colonial store was built. And there's what it looks like today. No, I take that back. That was, that was when it was still, that was when it was Johnny Willis's Gulf Station. And that was probably in the 70s or 80s. And That's when they started using all the military boats, the old military yeah, boats. That, well, that was not one, but that's, yeah, that's right. Converted that's them into Menhaden. And there, there's, your, uh, there's your Gulf Station and fins nowadays. So it's changed quite a bit. One of my favorite pictures, I'm not, I, I, there's not too much story to tell. Well, it maybe is. Uh, you can see the old colonial store with the chicken on the sign. Y'all remember the chicken on this colonial store sign? It's uh, right here. That's that's Mr. Paul's used car lot right there. Uh, that's Dr. Quadro's office when he was here. That's the Gulf Station sign for, uh, in those days, Webster Willis or Johnny Willis ran it. That's the police station. The Esso station, which was run by Alonzo Willis, later my father, is uh, there. Claude Wheatley's office. Right here, the largest thing in the Beaufort is the old Lippman building. Who remembers the Lippman building? Okay, not too many. Lippman building was built around the turn of the last century. It was three stories, which was by far the largest building in Beaufort. And it had an elevator that humans could ride. Uh, Mr. Lippman had his store down at the bottom. Store, uh, bottom uh, it was a department store. Bottom floor, the top two floors were offices. At one point, the phone company was in it, but that was that was way early. Later on, they moved in their own building behind the living room. Okay. Turner in front. Again, this is one of the most popular. I couldn't find a sign. I went down there looking for a sign, and I could not find a sign. So I had to make my own. And you can see I put Turner. <laughs> Toki, I know. I had to have one. That's one of the oldest of the Turner Street photographs. It's from the do end of the dock. <clears throat> if you were looking at that today, this would be about where the old police station is and where the, where the bathrooms are now. This would be where uh, uh, Beaufort Linens is. And then you can see about the only thing, that, that house there, can't remember what the name of it is, but that house is still in existence. Everything else there has changed. We do know what the name of that boat is. It was the Nettie B. Smith. And she was also like the Alfonso a freighter, a, a coastal freighter. That when I say coastal, I'm talking about like in Carter County or maybe to New York, but uh, that would be about it. <clears throat> and you can see they're unloading what looks like probably firewood and turpentine. That's what it looks like. This is probably firewood and this is turpentine. <coughs> or maybe they're loading it, I don't know. That's looking up Turner Street. That, yes, ma'am. That is looking north on Turner Street. From the water. From, the, from just over the over the breakwater. So it looks like the breakwater has been built there, so that looks like probably post-1917. Or not much post-1917. Mm -hmm. This is a 1922 uh, Al Thomas photograph on the top. Don't know what school that is, but, but they're all dressed alike, young ladies. That's Front Street <clears throat> between uh, Craven Street and um, Turner Street looking west towards Morgan. And you can see, and all those buildings have changed. They're, they're all gone. There's nothing there anymore. And, uh, well, as you can see, I took the bottom photo two years ago. Here's the old colonial store, the original old colonial store at the corner of Turner and Front. It burned down in 1956 and was rebuilt by the store that's there, the building that's there now that is now Beaufort Lenny. Livings. But it was still a colonial store. Right? It was still a colonial store. Yeah. Afterwards, it was still a colonial store. Now, I, 
I colorized the street lights there at the top next to them. Because, because believe it or not, we know from Santa Claus that those are Christmas lights. Oh. <coughs> our our uh, Christmas light decorations were rather humble in those days. <laughs> so we just had some colored lights and that was about it. We can see that this is about Christmas time. Lee's wearing a coat and everything. <coughs> They're selling Christmas foods there and everything. So, but yeah, that burned down and, and then was replaced by another building. That building. Now, I took this photograph when I was a kid from the bridge of Shadbo that was docked up behind uh, Webster Willis's village station. There's the police station you can see. <coughs> uh, this is the new colonial store that was built after the other one burned down with the chicken. That's what I'm calling the chicken sign. You see that? Uh, in the background, you see the old water tower, the original water tower. Mm. Uh, you can see what is now crew. In those days, it was Math Owens' grocery store. You can see the old phone station. What that, year did you say this is? Uh, Mom gave me her little brownie camera when I was a little boy, and I was probably nine years old, maybe 10, um, 1965, maybe 66, something like that. Oh, grandmother used to sit me down there with the exact change to get a half gallon of milk. I would be a nervous wreck, but not be the same yep. price. When did, it, when did it become the drugstore? Uh, Bell's Grocery Store moved, we'll talk about that in just a minute, oh, okay. but, but they, that's all right, but we, but they moved when Urban Renewal took their building. Oh, yeah. Did the Colonial Store ever move to a, another place off of Front Street? Not in Beaufort, I think, okay. they, just, yeah, I think they just closed it, yeah. What was the name of the grocery store where Claude, where A&P, A&P. Okay. That was at the corner of Queen and Front, yeah, originally. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. My story about the colonial store is we lived right through the block at 112 Orange Street. Oh. I had a dog named Yog. We weren't creative with names either. We just called him Dog for a long time. Somehow that morphed into Yog. So, but Yog had a, he was, he was a character. He would leave our house, and no, nobody kept their dogs pinned up in those days. We would leave our house and go stand at the front door of the colonial store until somebody would accidentally let him in. <laughs> Wouldn't touch a thing on any of the shelves. He would walk right straight to the butcher's, butcher's <laughs> yeah. thing in the back. All right. A fellow by the name of Rogers Graham worked there at the time. He was the butcher. Rogers would see my dog sitting there like that. He would go and get these bones <clears throat> that were about this big and give my dog, who was a beagle, the bone and, and let him out of the back door so that it, it wouldn't frighten people, I guess. <laughs> My dog would come back with his bone and chew his bone, chew the bones up. We'd come home from work or school or what have you, and there'd be this bone, you know, this bloody bone. Out there. My father said he thought that maybe an airplane had hit a pterodactyl the first time. <laughs> first time he saw like that. But that's what it was. Rogers would give my dog a bone, and that happened, you know, once a week it seemed like. There's my father's service station across the street, and that's Claude Wheatley's office right there. That building's the only one that survived Urban Renewal. It's still there. Imagine that. Yeah, imagine that. <laughs> Damn lawyers, what can we do? <laughs> so, so anyhow, and that's the that's that's SO story. Now that's back when Alonzo Willis owned it, I think. But Dad, had, Dad bought it in 61 or 62, I think. So Jeffrey, how, how many gas? I know we had a lot. That's how many gas stations, stations were in Beaufort? You mean, you mean more than one? Were <laughs> <laughs> there, there like eight or something? Uh, <laughs> all right, let's just for the fun of it. There was starting at the end. There was Harold Simpson's Texaco. Next one was um, Webster Willis's Gulf. My father's station. Next block down was Tom Potter's BP. Uh, what is BP? It was Sinclair in those days. On the corner of Ann and Live Oak was mm -hmm. Dalton Humphreys Station. Mm -hmm. At the corner, that's an SO. At the corner of uh, Cedar Street and Live Oak was Kelly's, some sixty six or something like that. There was one also when when the bridge came over onto Ann Street. There was one right in the first block of of Ann and uh, Moore Street. <laughs> Uh, there was one. The there was, that, was, that was the Gantt Station. There was a Gantt Station out on the other end of town, mm -hmm. out on the end of Live Oak. A, a bunch. Yes. There was a bunch. Eight. Eight at least. So far. Yeah. At, at least. But look, that, when I was when I was born, there were five grocery stores on Front Street alone. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Maybe six, if you include Math Owens. That was not on Front Street, but it was just off of Front Street. Mm -hmm. And five gas stations on Front Street. Yeah. Four. 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 Okay. And there's what's there now. I, I don't know what. It used to be the fudge place. I don't know what's there now. Some, some building. Oh, Beaufort, do you all remember anybody promising us that there wouldn't be anything built on the waterfront? <laughs> I thought I remember that. <laughs> all right, now here's a series of photographs that I love. This is the corner of Front Street and uh, Turner Street, again, looking east this time. And you see that everybody's happy and they've got the suits and the hats on, they've got their flags flying and everything. This is actually during the festival that occurred when the train first came to town in 1907. Actually, the train came in November of 06, but they didn't have, they didn't, they weren't ready yet, and so they had the celebration a few months later in July of 1907. And that's this photograph. Now you're looking down here, and it looks like, you know, where the heck is Front Street? It looks like it ends right there. Well, because it did. <laughs> Front Street ended at the intersection, not even at the intersection, actually about halfway between Queen Street and Craven Street. Oh, wow. yep. It ended. After that, there was a boardwalk over the, over the marsh, basically. Okay, so that's that's the first photograph. I thought of that boardwalk. Uh, it, they kept building onto the e ends of it. I mean, it started off being just basically to Live Oaks, no, not even Live Oaks, probably to Pollock Street. And they kept adding that onto it. Finally, it ended up going well beyond the old Atlantic Hotel. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute, too. And I'll show you a picture. But I, I think that it eventually went past Live Oak. Maybe, I don't know if it ever went to Fulford or not. This is a few years later. The only thing, I, the only way I know it's a few years later is because they put up a street light. So we got electricity now. By the way, until I met Rachel, I didn't realize that phone service started before electricity, but it did. Uh, about six or eight years before, actually. There was a guy that <laughs> lived in a Beaufort house uh, at the corner of Queen in front, and he wouldn't let them put the phone in his house because he thought it would burn it down. <laughs> made it put, made him put the phone on the pole in the backyard. So if you, had to, if you wanted to talk on the phone, you had to go out there and use it in the backyard. <coughs> I took this picture, right, standing in front of Dad's service station in 1976, I guess. I used to show it to my friends in college, and I'd say, a lot of people don't know this, but Beaufort actually was the scene of a battle during World War II. <laughs> Actually, what happened was U-boats came and shelled the town. <laughs> and people would look at me like, well, I've never heard that, but now it doesn't look like it. But, but that's urban renewal. Uh, conspicuously, as we were saying, Claude, Claude buildings survived. All the rest didn't. Is that not Moonrakers? No. Uh, no, no, that's, that's Moon Corner. Of that's the, that's, Ann's Revenge. that's right. Uh, the, where this photograph was taken, and you can see the you can see the hood of my old 72 Nova there. But you, that, that was taken uh, down Front Street from the corner of Front Street and Turner Street. There's another picture of Claude's building surviving. But there's not much left there, is there? I mean, they dug up the sewer and everything. And the Beaufort Women's Club had painted all of the fire hydrants, little cartoon characters just before this happened. <laughs> and they dug up the fire hydrants and threw them on the ground, in fact, I think. Uh, yeah, there's... <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh. My cousin Peggy was on it. Yeah. There's all three. The, the urban renewal photograph in the middle, the old celebration photograph, and today's photograph in the bottom. All from exactly the same spot. So there's a lot of change on Front Street over the last century or so. I remember looking at that. I mean, it was Romleys and... Yeah. Oh, no, no. That's, a, that's the next block up. Oh, yeah. yeah. We'll, get, we'll get there. There's the old Littman building. This is during a fire that occurred in uh, January of 1949. Uh, by the way, here's the taxi cab sitting in front of the taxi stand. 
Uh, you can see the Gulf Station sign. You can see the phone company. By the way, Middle Alley didn't go all the way through from Craven to Turner in those days. You can see that there's buildings all the way down the east side of Turner Street, and there was no opening there. Mm -hmm. So, so that, now somebody asked me about the bank. There it is, right there on the side. Okay. So, are you saying Middle Lane is a is also a change? That's not really a that wasn't really a thing. Uh, no, it was a thing, but the problem with it is, is it was. You have to understand that when Beaufort was laid out, the original Front Street lots were all a half a block deep. Okay. So Middle Lane was only a way that the garbage truck could get to the backs of the stores or the, you know, the delivery trucks could get to the backs of the stores. The people who owned Middle Lane were each of the sequential property owners on Front Street. Mm -hmm. So like for instance, there's been a little bit of talk about a building being built on Middle Lane recently. You might have heard. Yeah. That actually is at the very rear of the old First Citizens lot. That property was bought from First Citizens recently because it was part of the that Middle Lane had you know bisected, so to speak. Middle Lane at some point became a town street. It was after I left Beaufort in 74. Before then, it was owned by the property owners on Front Street. But that's the old Lipton building. And uh, like I said, Mr. Lipton was a man from Newburn who built that store in, 19, in the early part of the century, before 1911. <laughs> and um, it was a department store. There's what it looks like now. Same same photograph, or I should say, the same place. You can see the crew bar, but you can also see it. In this it was Matthew Lindsay's grocery store there. Now there's the Lipman building in 1911, so we know it was before 1911. <laughs> we can also see that the First Citizen Bank isn't there. Okay, the bank had, it actually is a bank there, but not, not the building, and it's not First Citizens, it was the Bank of both. And it was in one of these buildings, I can't remember, I think it was that one. Later on, the Bank of Mo Beaufort moved to another bank. Now this, is a, this was another photograph that I did that showed the Esso station my father had, Front Street, <coughs> with the bank. This building, right here, is this building right here. Oh. This over here, what happened was, is the bank bought this old bank building and bought the Littman store and demolished them. And built this new addition and this new addition and a parking lot with a drive through tunnel. That was in 68 or 69. But this building right here and this building are the same. That's the original bank. Mm -hmm. That was not a First Citizens Bank until 1930s, sometime in the 30s, 36, 34, something like that. <clears throat> they actually came here during the Depression, which is kind of odd. This is on the south side of Front Street. This is where the old Bank of Beaufort that used to be on the north side of Front Street, somewhere, you know, I pointed to it earlier, went to the south side and built a beautiful, bank. It's hard to imagine that Beaufort had the wealth to build something like that, but we did, or they did. That was the old bank of Beaufort. Uh, had columns, had uh, floors inside that were made out of the tiny little tile, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, beautiful wooden teller windows and such. It went bankrupt during the Depression and never came back. When I was a child, it was Jim Rumley's feed store. Yeah. You can see where it was feed. So little bitties at Easter time that made them that were dyed pink and blue. Yes, and yes. Yeah. Turtles, little turtles. Uh, yeah. turtles. Yeah. turtles. Yeah. Of course, that was demolished during Urban Renewal. Here's another picture of, of you all remember Gaskell's Hardware out on Live Oak Street? Well, before it was on Front Street, and that's a photograph of it. It's on the south side of Front Street. A little bit down from the bank, a little bit east of the bank. Uh, that's a that was a, a, a dairyman who used a, a bull as his animal that it would haul free in Beaufort. And now, somebody asked me about Bell's Drugstore. That's the original Bell's Drugstore that was at the, the south corner of Craven and Front Street. The store was there forever and ever and ever. It was there when I was a child. Okay. Bell's Drugstore. 
There's another photo probably in the what, 50s, judging from those cars in the 50s sometime, Bell's Drugstore. Yeah. <clears throat> There's Bell's Drugstore in the 1960s when the East Carter High School band was marching by. The rest of the buildings on south, uh, south side of Front Street were also still there when this photograph was taken. Isn't that Doris Dinette? Doris Dinette, yep. <laughs> Old, Blue, Old Blue ran that. Actually, his wife, Doris Dean. Where, where is it? The Mayola Sun. The Mayola yep. okay. That's right. Mm -hmm. And you can see. Uh, and the uh, newsstand, isn't it? The newsstand between yep, Doris Dinette. That's exactly right. We used yeah. to go sneak out of church and then Sundays and go down there and she'd be open. We'd sit there and watch, read comic books. Yep. And they were always at the very back. Uh huh. <laughs> with the spicy, the well, they had spicy books right here too. Uh, you can see the, uh, you see the Jim Rumley's bank right there. You can see C.D. Jones, C.D. Jones Grocery was right there. Yeah. Right next door was Ike Moore's yeah. Grocery, right. City Grocery. Mm -hmm. Yep. Here's directly across the yeah. street from that. Right. This is old Roses. Right. How many people remember the old wooden floors and roses? Freaking and, and smell, smell it to break the sense. Yes, popcorn, <laughs> cotton candy. Uh, they had on the fabric. Yep, yeah, that's right. Every smell in the world. Good gracious. <laughs> First stop. Every uh -huh. that's, that's, that's what became Clausen's. Part yes, Clausen's. Oh, yeah. Is oh. it should say I. Well, what happened was is it stayed roses when after Clausen bought uh, uh, not Clausen but Rogers bought. Clausen's, um, he eventually bought the Roses. Do y'all remember in the back there was a sound stage where some bands used to come called uh, Tobacco Roses? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. It, it was the re yes, it was Tobacco Roses. But the reason why they called it is because when he was, all the workers were, when he was redoing the back where the, it was the back of the roses store, and so they, they would call it the back of roses. <laughs> That's where the name came from. <laughs> yeah. yep. There's the old Clausen's original building that is still there when it was Clausen's. It was a, it was a, uh, it was a restaurant, not a restaurant, a, a grocery store slash sundry store, general store, and then the back was a bakery. The bakery is still there. It's called Backstreet Pub. Uh, my father grew up diagonally across Middle Lane at 121, 125 Craven Street. He had three brothers and a mom and dad, of course. It, my grandmother would make a big pot of beans every Saturday with the uh, molasses and the brown sugar and the fat back in it. And would hand them to my dad, who was like five years old. I said, go take this to the baker over. He, dad would toddle across the uh, alley and hand the bean pot to the baker in what is now uh, the Backstreet Pub. He put it in with the bread and it would bake those beans so that by lunchtime they would be in, Mom, Grandma would send somebody else to go get the beans, Dad or one of my uncles, and that's what they would have during the Depression for a week, <laughs> probably. But yeah, that's, uh, that, and, but like I said, that behind that building now, the bakery is still there. There's the building today. This is a different building. And I want to talk about this one because this one's got some stories. I don't know who that man is. I thought it was Billy Tickle, but Michelle says no. So I don't know who it is, but that is the old Potter building that was at the corner of Craven Street and Front Street. It was a two-story building, but it was a tall building, kind of like the Clausen's building. This is an old city bus going by, so this is right around World War II, maybe a little bit before. Was the Potter's Emergency Hospital upstairs? And I cannot find a photograph of it to save my butt. This is one of the two or three that comes even close. But just behind what I think is Billy Tickle still is the Potter's Emergency Hospital. Dr. Moore had his office. Dr. Moore had his office there. And, uh, Dr. Maxwell had the office there. It was a nine bed hospital. Nine beds is all they had. But let me tell you, between 1921 or 22 is when it was established and when it finally was, uh, I guess maybe they ceded their power to the Moorhead City Hospital, whatever. But a lot of people were born there. 
A lot of people got treated there and some people died there. It was the hospital for everybody in Beaufort and it was the hospital for just about all of Down East. And there are still Down East people my age and older, well, older than me, that were born there at the, at the emergency hospital. So it would have been behind this man right here on the second story next to this building right here, which was doctors and dentists offices and such as that. Now, down here, before, 19, before 1939, this was the post office in Beaufort. Before 1939, it was the post office right there. In 39, when the new federal building was built, it was further down the street. A fellow by the name of uh, Joe House became a licensed pharmacist. He came back to Beaufort and he established his pharmacy in this building down here where the post office used to be. Uh, Joe House, you've met him. Joe House lived at the corner of Moore and Front Street. Remember that house? I said, I don't know, I don't know who, what, the, what the actual name of it is, but Joe House and his wife used to live there. It was the same man. Had a pharmacy there. <clears throat> On a cold, December night, cold, gosh, knows it was cold. Cold December night in 1958, I was asleep at 121 Craven Street. I think that there's a real estate office in my bedroom now. <laughs> it's right on Middle Alley, 121 Craven. I was asleep, and my mom came and woke me up. I was only three. Woke me up and said, get whatever your favorite toy is, we're leaving. And the, the room was orange. It was, I'll never forget it. The room was orange. And so I got up and I didn't, I was, didn't know what I, where's dad? Dad's gone. Dad's helping the fireman. I said, well, I, I don't understand. But, I, but anyhow, we packed up our stuff. And we didn't get far. We went next door to my grandmother's house. But, uh, but what had happened was, is during that cold night, the furnace in Joe House's drugstore has a malfunction, caught the building on fire, it was burning, which was right beside us. Sally, Sally Thomas's house was between ours and that, but it was close enough that everything was glowing orange and red. <clears throat> um, fire company came, they almost had it out, and they ran out of water because it was so cold, the town pumps had frozen. And so the, pump, the, the uh, fire, fire hydrants went dry. So they went down to the Sinclair dock, which was right in front of this guy, and put their hoses in the water and fought the fire the best they can, but the wind was blowing so hard that it actually caused nine different buildings along Front Street to burn to the ground and damage a lot more of it. It re rearranged the way South Front Street looked. And also, the building on the uh, other side of Craven Street that was uh, a jewelry company, Jervis here and owned the jewelry company and it burned it to the ground and melted it. So that was the 58 fire. It was probably my early, earliest memory. That's the one I can still see in my mind. Here is the other picture I have. That's of the drugstore. You can see it's a Rexall drug now. And up there in that window, this is the closest I've ever come, that was the old emergency hospital. There's, that's a nighttime photograph that I've doctored and doctored and doctored. That's a nighttime newspaper photograph of the fire because it happened in the middle of the night. This building right here is Jarvis's jewelry store. Here's, here it is during another disaster, Hurricane Hayes, <laughs> and you can see. But that's the old building. The wind is broken out, the storm broke it out. But uh, that was the building that burned burn the rest. Here's the front page of the News, of the news Times uh, in 1958. And you can see the fire. Cleans out nine businesses. Uh, it's almost... My father and I always had problems with the News Times. I mean, if it had been a business in Moorhead City or Atlantic Beach, it would have said, terrible fire destroys poor people's businesses. If it was a Beaufort fire, it would say, Blaze cleans out 10 businesses or whatever. <laughs> so wait, wait, wait the headline from Anyhow, just a, just a bias. Now, let me tell you a sad story. This, who knows, who has ever heard of Judge Jules Duncan? 
Duncan. That's right. Jewel, Jewel Duncan uh, was a was a uh, lawyer in town. He really never was a judge, but everybody thought so much of him they called him judge. Anyhow, he was a lawyer in town, and he had a son who was also very active in the town uh, the politics and such. That's Jewel Duncan Jr. Right there, he's wearing a helmet because he became a uh, watchman during World War II. What do you call him? Home air guard or an air raid warrior or whatever. During this fire, he fought the fire. He was a volunteer fire. In fact, he was the he was the chief of uh, fire department for a while. But he fought the fire all night during that terrible cold night. And about daylight, when they got the fire sort of under control, he said, guys, i got to go home. He was living in the Duncan house, the very first picture I, told, I showed you. Today. He walked down front or up front street towards Moorhead City. He took one step on the porch and fell dead of a heart attack. He was 48 years old. Uh, his wife, Sarah, who I knew, uh, Sarah didn't find him until like two or three hours later. She got up and walked out, didn't know where he had gone or where he was. Knew he had been fighting the fire, but found him in a pile. That's him. <clears throat> Here's another series of uh, photographs. Of, this is from the Littman building. So we know all of these photographs are after 1910, 1911, something like that. <clears throat> if you look at this one, first of all, no automobiles. Okay? Second of all, clearly, Front Street ends at the end of the street here. <clears throat> okay. Right between Craven and Queen. Okay, but there's all the uh, buildings on the south side that were different businesses. Uh, Gaskins Hardware is right there. But you know, that's the first one. Some years later, somebody crawled up into the same window and took this photograph. Lots of cars now. This is in the 30s or late 20s. We know because Front Street has been extended for the east. And we can see some of the businesses that are still in town. Like for instance, this one here. We know, uh, we know, I found a bunch of advertisements for the Beaufort Bargain Store, but the newspapers only go back to 1920. And there were advertisements for the store in 1920, so I don't know how old it was even then. But this is before, we know it's before 20, because obviously Front Street doesn't. Front Street was extended in 13, by the way. Okay, so there's the next one. Years later, somebody crawled up into the same window and took that photograph. Now this is in the 40s. This is around World War II. Bailey store is here. Jones, uh, C.D. Jones Grocery is there. Ike Moore store, the City Grocery is there. Uh, the bank is, is there. It's, I think probably it's still the bank. I don't think it's the feed store in there. Uh, down here is where the other station was, the Sinclair Station, uh, Davis Fish Company here, uh, Ramsey Grossing next to it. So, Littman's store, you can see it right there. I climbed up into the place that was about where Littman's was and took that picture. Not quite exactly, I was on top of the bank. When I took that picture, probably in 78, 9, something like that. Mm -hmm. After Urban Renewal, after the dock house was built, after the restaurant down there was built, but, but uh, after Urban Renewal. I had my friend uh, Roger Whitehurst, he could look at four or five different cars and tell me exactly when it was taken. Okay, now if you put them all together, there's the change in Front Street on the south side. And what were those years again? Uh, this is pre 1913. This was probably 25. To 30, something like that. This is war years, roughly. And this I took probably as blurry as it is. Uh, I, I took that probably in 70, not, not quite 80, 79, 78, something like that. And one more picture. There's the fire of 52, January 52 which started in a Roulain company. You can see all the buildings there. <clears throat> and what it looks like today. Same perspective, same building. Hmm. Front Street in Craven. That is, uh, it was titled Fish Davis, but Michelle corrected me, Michelle Davis corrected me that that's her uncle. 
Charles Davis, who owns now or did used to own Charles Davis Fish Company. Charles Davis Fish Company was back here. Do what now? Steve, you knew him? It looks like the son. Yeah, but it, it does. That's right. But, but yeah, that's him. And he was standing in front of what was then the post office. And somebody took his picture. That's what this same, almost same, looked like during Hurricane uh, Hazel. See, all these buildings were demolished during urban renewal. Mm -hmm. the big shoe shop, the, uh, the Sinclair Station, which was still an HC, whatever that stood for. Uh, Ramsey Grocery, you know, another one of the grocery stores. Seafood, Davis Seafood Company, uh, and the Wayfish House. A lot of history there. This is one my mother took back before I was born. She was actually kind of, uh, she loved photography and experimented with colored slides before anybody else in our family did. And that was a picture that she took. See the movie theater? I've been trying to figure out what was playing, but I can't let the poles up away. But it was a movie theater there and all that was going on. The sign says, street closed for fall cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently they cleaned it after every hurricane season. <laughs> And that's the way it looks now. So no, nothing left at all from, from those photographs. Here's another photograph uh, looking down the street towards the west. This is the old Clausen's building. This is the Lipman building. And this is the Potter building that burned down in the fire. And then all the buildings on the south side. This lady is named um, Laura Duncan. She lived, there was a lot of Duncan on the street. She lived in the house that was raised. Is that the one you took piano lessons in? Yeah. Yep. Raised right there next to what was then Guthrie Jones Drugstore. It's, okay. it's still there. Academy. It mm -hmm. the, the academy. Well, it was. They started off being a, a girls' school. That's right. The, uh -huh. the Carter Academy or Water, Beaufort Academy. Miss Lena Duncan ended up being the last. Yes. The last <clears throat> that's that's right, Miss Lena. <clears throat> she told my uncle that he was educated well beyond his means. <laughs> <laughs> but there's across the street. Now that woman there, this is another Al Thomas photograph. So I know who who's in it. Uh, I can't remember this guy's name, but that's Sally Duncan, who was Lena's older sister. Oh. That's right across the street from where Sally lived. And you can see the fish houses in the back. Front Street was a ruddy mess then, too, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. That was, I can tell you exactly when that was taken, taken in 1920. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there's the academy. Mm -hmm. And as it looks today, they raised it, but I never didn't understand it. They raised it a little bit, but not a lot. I guess maybe they just had to have some headroom downstairs or something, but they elevated it. You can see maybe, what, two feet? Maybe a foot and a half, something like that. There's the old Guthrie Jones drugstore. Yeah. Fermadale, do you remember the Guthrie Jones drugstore? Drugstore cowboys. That's. Hang out of that front window there on the way. <laughs> I might have a picture of that. You might have. <laughs> Cherry Cooks. I work there. Yep. And then yeah. do, you, do you remember her? <laughs> and Cheryl Temple Cheryl. and Ann Vick. Yeah. They were they were the two of the people who worked behind it. They could make chicken salad sandwiches good. <laughs> Chair. And there's what's there now. The, the Jarrett bed. And that was where Granddaddy's office was. He was the first. And uh -huh. The next one down was Dr. Salter. That's right. And then Mike's. Mike's was there. That's right. Now, now it's ribeyes. Yep. And uh, there used to be Toad Clausen's hardware store where ribeyes is now. Toad, it was actually called Beaufort Hardware, I think. Harder, Harder, Beaufort Hardware. Yeah, Beaufort Hardware Store, but it was, uh, we all call it, because Toad Clawson owned it. Uh, but that was what was there with ribeyes in. I bought a mini a sinker and a mini a pinfish hook from Toad Clawson. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> and then yeah. there was the old movie theater. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh. yep. They're looking in. I know, it. that was after it closed, I think, immediately. I don't know, it closed just before Urban Renewal. That's what's there now, the general store. 
Now, this is the reason why zero setbacks are bad. I'm going to show you that. Believe it or not, in Beaufort's downtown, with all of our other regulations that we have to deal with, setback isn't one of them. You can build right on the property line. When I was told that recently, I thought, well, to be sure there's a North Carolina uh, statute that prevents that, but there isn't. Hmm. And you can build right on the property line to this day in the business district of downtown Beaufort. Business, wow. business district. Yep. Now, the reason why I say that that's important is look at this old picture here. And that picture is actually, by the way, old photographs sometimes are pretty good. The lenses were good back in those days, and if you had a pretty good negative, a glass plate mm -hmm. negative, you could blow them up with a lot of detail. You see that? These, this, this is what I'm showing you. It has a blow up of that very front porch song. Oh, wow. And <clears throat> that's something. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with photography back in those days. It was just took a little bit longer. And that's what it is today. Oh. Wow. That's why we we don't need zero setbacks, folks. Mm -hmm. That's what happens when when you let people build uh, right on the property line. They will build every. They will fill every inch that you let them. Mm -hmm. Every single inch. Queen Street and Front Street. Another a series, my favorite series. This photograph was taken right after the Civil War. I puzzled and puzzled and puzzled as to where this was. I kept thinking Ann Street. I thought Moore Street. I finally went back and I downloaded from the archives, the original image, rather than using a screenshot. When I downloaded, I got a lot more resolution, and I found out this sign says Queen Street, and this one says Front Street. Oh, wow. So that is Queen and Front. Queen going down to the left, and Front going across the front. And you can see someone's cow out there, eating. <laughs> in those days, the everybody had fences in front of their houses, not to keep animals in, but to keep them out. And I'm quite serious about that because people just let their animals, their horses and cows, roam free, a lot of, especially their cows and their goats. And uh, so they ran free. That is the corner of Queen and Front. This is looking in a different direction. This is the boardwalk. This is the beginning of the boardwalk. The uh, Queen Street actually would be about right here, and then further down, right at the corner, is where the whole custom house was, and that's the custom house flag right there around Craven Street. But that was the beginning of the boardwalk. There's a picture of the boardwalk. Somebody asked me how long was it. I don't think that was the end. I think that, that that's probably in front of Pollock Street or maybe even halfway to Live Oak. But you can see it was a long boardwalk. Here's another picture of it. <clears throat> it was a long, and there were docks off of the boardwalk that went to fish houses and to net reels and other stuff. Look at this thing right here. That's the, that's the demarcation between Old Town and, and New Town. And it still is there. There it is. Same photograph again at the bottom. I took them right there to where the same spot. And you're thinking, well, look, how did they get all that dirt there? Well, they pumped it up. It was it was dredging spoils from Taylor's Creek and Gallant's Channel that they used to build up the Front Street. Mm -hmm. yeah. Here's after they did that, immediately after in 1920. It's not immediately, but a few years afterwards. You can still see they've got the seawall there, but the old bulkhead is still visible above it. That's remember me tell you about Reginald Selman? That's his baby son, Bruce Selman. 1920 is when this was taken. Another picture from that same series. This this house right here was C.P. Day's mansion. C.P. Day was the daddy of the Manhattan industry. <clears throat> the old the old setback. Example, that house right there, you can still see it before it was uh, obstructed by other buildings. Is that the inlet in? On That's the, the inlet in. The closest to us is the inlet in. Okay. Absolutely. Where, where? Right here. The old one. That's Wade's fish house. Dad said that uh, if Beaufort blew away one day, 
the way he's fish out for still be there because the wind blew through it. I did this collage some time ago. I used to walk down Front Street every day and I carried my camera. Those are all imprints that were made in 1917 along the way. They're still there to this day <coughs> of children and dogs and people. Handprints, footprints, initials, all of them would have a date or somewhere around September of 1970. They're still there if you look for them. There's C.P. Day's mansion. You're looking sort of, uh, you're looking northeast there. Front Street goes this way, Queen Street goes this way. Another view of C.P. Day's. That's the old house. Remember the Civil War house with the cow in front? <clears throat> There's Charles Tolson's great uncle dry, uh, riding his bicycle on Front Street. That's the way house. Front Street has been extended, though. That's the way it looks now, down Front Street, towards the west. Hurricane of 33, I think. Yeah. And that's a collage that I decided to use as a uh, standard bearer for this this talk. That's the same location, stood on exactly the same spot in three different photographs. This one is immediately after the Civil War, 66, 67, something like that. Mm -hmm. This one is uh, before 1913, probably about 1910, I think. Something like that, C.P. Day's mansion with his war pump is still there. And then what's there now, which is a hotel. Is that in Lillian? In Lillian, I think, yeah. Lots of changes. And this, if you turn around and look the other direction, you see uh, down the street, you can see a shad boot there, you see the old town dock. Um, man, we're gonna, you, 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 you're on my pedestal there. There we go. You can see that, that was in the 40s. You can see there was still a beach there uh, the kids played on. I think that that's Anna Pearson. She owned and operated the Inlet Inn. She's my friend, uh, uh, an architect from New Bern's, was her son. I'm trying to remember what his name was. I'll think of it in a minute. But that's the same, same. Huh? That's pretty skin. Yeah, it is. <laughs> she's, got, she's, got some, she's got enough rocker in her that tells me that she probably was under sale from time to time, too. That's a kid catching, that's a, uh, who heard of Acock Brown before? Yeah. Acock Brown was a newspaper photographer for the Beaufort News. Mm. He took that picture, and so that was back in the late 30s. That's the end of the end in the background. Okay. That house directly over his left shoulder is still there, if I'm not mistaken. And the old water tower in the extreme left. And that not a bad sheep head. Mm. <laughs> There's the end of the end. Yeah. And that's what it looks like today. The captain of the um, Coastal Queen, is that what, it, what the name of that tour boat is? He let me up on the bridge of that boat to take that picture. Crystal Coast. Crystal right? Coast, that was it. Yeah. Well, that's the tour boat. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, that's the yeah. Truett Tru Tru Bank. Mm -hmm. So front and Pollock, there's the new post office. Remember the other one was in the Potter Building? Yeah. 1939, they built that, 37 to 39. And that's the new post office, actually, I think, before it was even occupied. <clears throat> they had to move that house, Doctor, was it Dr. Moore's house? It was a doctor. I can't remember which one. But they, they actually had to move it east on its own lot because it used to be directly beside the Inland Inn. So they moved it east on its lot, tore down part of this ballastone fence, and then put the post office right there. What about Dr. Duncan? Dr. Duncan. But there was a doctor who owned it that sold it to Dr. Duncan. Oh, okay. And I can't remember who that was. Here's the demolition of the old house and the movement of it. They didn't tear it down, they moved it and tore down the foundation. 
here's some Beaufort people that stand out in front of the post office. That's this brick facade to the left and the newly moved house. This is <coughs> like during World War II-ish. <laughs> that's what it looks like today. There's the Alfonso again. I don't need to talk about that picture. There's the Alfonso after it was dragged ashore and made into a museum. Yeah, that's, I don't remember. Do you remember that? <laughs> the Museum of the Sea. Graydon yeah. Paul did that. He bought the Alfonso. She was fetched up on a shoal, bought her from Otis Purefoy, and uh, dragged her up on the, and made a, 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 a museum of sorts. And you would pay a nickel or whatever it was and go down and look at the, the stuff. That's where the park is, right? Green park, right. park. That's where that's where yeah. there's a park. Yeah. It looks by the way, there's the old town dock that's in front of what used to be the post office. Look at the how the what we call the bird show will look. Oh my gosh. You can see you look right out of the end, it sits walk down the post office door, look right straight out of the end. Almost almost no vegetation, almost no shovel there. There's kids playing on the old dock. Again, you know, in the distance, you can see Shackler Banks. You just can't see the bird shoals not there. The bird shoals there, but there's no no land there. <clears throat> so there's what the Alfonso site looks like. Now. It's that town dock, town, town park. Now another story. I know. Are y'all? Who's getting bored? Nobody. Good. This is the. Everybody thinks Atlantic Hotel, and the first thing you think of is Morehead City, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the Atlantic, the original Atlantic, Atlantic Hotel was in Beaufort, and it was built in the 1850s by a fella by who was actually uh, a Pender, who was the first cousin of William Dorsey Pender, the famous Confederate general. This guy was named Josiah Pender. He operated the Atlantic Hotel in the 50s and 60s. He's the one who took a, a, a crowd of Beaufort people, men, my great-great-grandfather included, across to capture Fort Macon at the beginning of the Civil War. Of course, it wasn't much of a fight because there was only one guy there. He was, they basically went and knocked on the door and said, can I, can I have the keys, please? So, but anyhow, that was the Atlantic Hotel. It was built out over the water, not, not on the shore, over the water. It was a frame building, wooden frame building. This is the only frontal image I've ever found of it, and that was in a Charlotte newspaper, an 1850s or 60s Charlotte newspaper. It's a lithograph advertising this for summer operation. This is a side view that's an actual photograph. This is the only photograph of the Atlantic Hotel. It's from the east side looking west down the boardwalk that we know about now. See, it's built out over the water. And it was a venue for everybody in North Carolina and surrounding states to come and stay and enjoy the south breezes and the water, and they had fishing trips, and they had camping trips, and they had a beautiful ballroom, and they had a bar with all kinds of beverages and everything. It was a fantastic place. And everything went well until the, the fall of 1879. In the fall of 1879, Governor Jarvis, Thomas Jarvis, came down to stay at the Atlantic Hotel from Raleigh. He had just been elected, uh, and he wanted to come because the newly formed North Carolina Press Association was having its annual conference at the Atlantic Hotel. So he came with his delegation, and the newspaper and the news press uh, people were there. And the Coast Guard station said, it was in existence then, said, y'all might want to think about evacuating the front street because there's a storm coming and we can't tell you how bad it is, but it's a storm coming. And the owner, who was by that time somebody other than Josiah Pender, said, uh, storms always miss here. We're, uh, we're probably not going to evacuate. After all, the governor's here and the press association, and we're just not going to evacuate. And the Coast Guard says, well, do what you want, but you better evacuate. Turned out to be a high category three hurricane, maybe a low four. And the reason why I would know that is because the anemometers blew away during the storm. We don't know how fast the wind was blowing when it hit, but we do know that it hit Beaufort right square in the middle. 
and what happened immediately was the Atlantic Hotel started decomposing because of the waves. You all know that, I, as, as I, do I, that the wind really isn't the problem, even though this was plenty of wind. What happens is, is the waves, there was no bird show, came right in the inlet and started crashing up underneath and lifting the building up. As that happened, it began to disintegrate. And at some point, sometime early, three o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, people started scrambling. Turned out that there was a man named Palmer Davis, a black man who had been a slave. I told you about him. He heard what was going on or saw it or whatever and rushed down just in time to see the thing crash into the surf. And he waded out into the rubble and rescued I don't know how many children and brought them ashore. That's a, not the actual happening. It's one that I found on the internet. But that's Palmer Davis. And he, the governor, saw this happen and declared him to be the hero of the hour. And he was in all the newspapers in North Carolina from Charlotte, Charlotte East. Uh, and became locally, obviously, famous for it. Uh, had quite a life thereafter. Now, that's, that is the Atlantic Hotel location today. Underneath that street are the pylons of the old Atlantic Hotel, I can guarantee you. A lot of people, not a lot. I think that they, two or three people got ultimately got killed. But like I said, he was the governor himself. Didn't have any clothes. Uh, he escaped wearing his nightshirt. Um, he had to borrow a sailor's uniform from the War of eighteen twelve that somebody in town had in their closet. And that's how he went back to Raleigh dressed as a sailor from eighteen twelve. Uh, I mean, both are both are. People opened up their houses to the rest, to the people who were at the Atlantic Hotel and got them clothed and got them, you know, squared away. There was no train; they had to go across, you know, on a sharpie and get on the train and more. He didn't go back to Raleigh. Now, didn't they use that for a hospital or something? They did indeed. Uh, I, I used to be able to tell you the name of it, but Hammond. I can't. Uh, Hammond. Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, when the when the Federal Army captured Beaufort in March of 1862. They immediately uh, took seized that hotel and turned it into a, a, a hospital, and it was terrible hospital. I mean, the nasty, terrible hospital. Until I'm not, I'm not, I'm, this is the truth. Until uh, a delegation of Catholic nuns came down and saw what they said this won't do, and so the Catholic nuns started running the hospital thereafter, and it turned out to be a good hospital. Yeah. But uh, that's exactly right. There is a empty lot at the intersection of Marsh Street and Pine Street, which is out uh, north of town. It's always been an empty lot. The story is that the it is empty because the black people who were slaves uh, that were in that hospital died during that time, and they were buried in that lot, and so nobody has ever built anything on that lot since. The intersection, it is the southwest corner of Marsh and Pine Street. Mm -hmm. If you go by there today, you will see that it's got big oak trees growing on it, but no, there's nothing built on it. Mm -hmm. If you go a little bit further on Pollock, there's the old laboratory that Julian <coughs> Arrington and his wife Beth live in now. That's a lithograph of it. Mm -hmm. It looks like that now. Mm -hmm. With all the flowers in front. Mm -hmm. yeah. Gordon in front. This is my one of my photographs that uh, was, comes down to me from from Mr. Acott Brown. <clears throat> That's some girls bicycling in 1936. And front street in the background. One more. You all know the back, about the hammock house. I'm sure. Blackbeard, supposedly, Blackbeard never so, set foot in that house. <laughs> that house was built in 1800, and he, he was killed in 18, what, 14, 15, something like that. There it is now. Old photograph during the war, or, uh, when it was a, an apartment complex. Front in Bel Air. Here's the only thing. Now, my father used to answer the telephone. When he didn't want to talk to anybody, he'd say, Car glass and barrel factor. <laughs> What he was saying, if you slowed it down, was Cardrit Molasses and Barrel Factory. And I always said, Dad, what was that? 
I don't know, that's something my father used to say, my grandfather. Well, I was looking through this Mr. Spellman's photographs, these 1920 photographs, and there was one that was titled Barrel Factory. Mm -hmm. I'm going, well, I've never heard of a barrel factory in Beaufort. So I started doing research. Sure enough, for three or four years between 1919 and 1921, there was a barrel factory on Front Street mm -hmm. that made barrels. And unfortunately, they, they devised this. It was some local guys. Rumley was one of them. They, de they devised this because they thought, well, fish, and we've got a train now, and uh, fish and, and produce can be barreled and shipped away, and this was bound to be a market for it. What they hadn't counted on was that was about when cardboard was invented. And so the barrel factory didn't last too long. <laughs> but that, that actually is a photograph of the barrel factory, and that's taken from Taylor's Creek. Well, that, that was 1920. Like okay, it would be right here. <clears throat> Front Street Extended, that's Bel Air Street, I think, going up there. Mm -hmm. And the lot, the reason why I know that is because I finally found the uh, deeds in the Register of Deeds office and went and located it. It was located in what was then called Beaufort Heights. <laughs> but if you, uh, I can, uh, I found the deed and actually plotted it out on a map, and uh, that's, that's the location of the old barrel factory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, no, it's not in Old Town. It's in Beaufort Heights, which is down the Bel Air Street. You said Old Town. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I thought you said Old Town. That's the answer. There's a picture of the location. There's a picture. Front. I don't even think those people know it. Wouldn't matter if they did, I mean. But, but yeah, that's the location. Of it. Okay, one last thing. There's the old golf course. Who knew that there was a golf course in Beaufort? Exactly. <laughs> yep. That is the Sea Gulf Breeze Gulf Breeze Golf Course. That was a that was a golf course that actually struck, was between Front Street and Lennoxville Road, but mostly on Lennoxville Road. And that was the clubhouse, and they're playing golf out there in the hot sun. And you can see an aerial view of it. It's kind of blurry because it's not focused down there on the bottom. But you, you can see an aerial view in 1939. And you can see that's Taylor's Creek, and then across the street, both front and Lynchville Road, is the golf course. Mm -hmm. Short lived, didn't live, didn't last too long, but uh, but it was a it was a quite a quite the thing in the end day. And that's another barrel factory photograph. Then finally the fish factory, and you can see 34 North there now. That's Beaufort Fisheries from the air, and 34 North. That's built. You can see the same creek that goes up the side to the east. Now it's got bridges across it. And that ends Front Street. That's a photograph my my fiance took, the top one and the bottom one of what it is now. That's the old Beaufort Fisheries, the one she took up the top. That was after it closed a year or two. Yep. And that's the end. Huh? Want me to go back two slides? <laughs>